welcome very, uh, very warmly to this afternoon's SVA meeting. This is the second of three meetings. And if anybody has any questions to ask John Griffiths, uh, you can ask the questions at any time during the meeting simply by using the chat button and then we'll pick up the messages and ask John at the very end of the meeting. Uh, the <coughs> title, as you can see, is Sidmouth Cinemas and Theatres, and John has always been fascinated in theatre and cinema. Uh, indeed, he, he was fascinated by the buildings from an early age. Uh, and as a child, he would build models of them. He has spent his life working in theatres and cinemas, first as an actor and then a cinema manager, uh, finally moving back into theatre as a front of house manager uh, before uh, retiring to Sidmouth. Uh, and we look forward to the talk uh, very much indeed. And so I think now we should dim the lights and let the performance begin. Over to you, John. Thank you very much, Nigel. And hello, everyone. Um, first, I'd like to tell you what I find unique about Sidmouth's theatres and cinemas and what prompted me to write a book on the subject. First, I was impressed that the town still has a traditional cinema and theatre. Now, I know they're not open at the moment due to these uh, dreadful times, but they will be one day and they're well appreciated and well liked by the people of Sidmouth. And then I discovered that how many other venues there were that had been used for that purpose. Some still standing, albeit put to other uses, but others sadly lost. And then I was fascinated to uh, discover that uh, how many local people had been involved with the development of them. Local architects, builders, property developers, landowners, and even a local photographer. So today I'd like to give you a taste of my book. Uh, we'll start to talk about the uh, buildings that are still with us, the Manor Pavilion and the Radway, and then we'll move on to see some other buildings in the town. So if I could uh, show you the first slide, which I'm sure you'll recognise as the Radway Cinema. And this is the fine prominent building you see at the top of the town when you enter from the north. Now, Although the Radway has been showing films for over 90 years, not many people know that it actually started life as a theatre and the stage was used for many times in that period. Now, architecturally, the, the Radway was built at a time of change when uh, theatre de designers were building theatres in the late 20s. And it, it, it was a, a more smooth and art deco feel to it rather than the uh, Victorian idea of balconies and red gilt and plush and the Radway is a true example of this plain mixed style art deco look. It was built by a local architect called P.E. Stedman and he was commissioned by the Radway Development Company to build um, 18 houses which are behind it, a parade of shops and initially a public hall. And in the final stages of the development, he was asked to change the design and use of the hall into a theatre. And this he did, and very successfully. It had 680 seats, a tea room, a small balcony, a stage 22 foot deep, along with dressing rooms. And interestingly, he uh, built a projection box high on the roof. And the Radway opened as a theatre on uh, June the 25th, 1928. And uh, you can see here the original first uh, poster that appeared for an all-star variety show, which was presented on that night and ran for the whole week. It, it then ran as a theater for about 18 months, presenting all sorts of attractions, uh, variety shows, uh, repertory companies, uh, the local amateur societies used it, musical comedies, and even a pantomime. But change came in 1929 when just down the road competition arrived and that was in the form of the Grand Cinema. Now films, especially talking films, were very, very popular in those days and it proved fierce competition for the Radway. So the Radway bowed down to this competition and started to show films itself. 
And uh, the first film was on the 2nd of December, 1929, which was a film called Kitty. Now for the first couple of years or so of, of it uh, being a cinema, it wasn't that successful. Uh, perhaps it found too much competition from the newly opened Grand. So it reverted back to being a theatre and again, touring shows visited as, as well as uh, the annual pantomime. However, it, it obviously was struggling. And uh, by 1935, it was taken over by the management of the Grand Cinema, and they ran the two buildings side by side as a joint enterprise. In fact, they were advertised as Sidmouth Super Cinemas. Uh, and this it continued uh, for quite a few years. Um, interestingly, it became, the name changed in 1936, and it became the Palace. I haven't actually been able to find out why they did this name change. Maybe it was because to, to give it a more fresh look and um, sort of so it could compete even more with the grand, but it didn't last for long. And uh, the name was changed again in 1937 and it reverted back to the Radway. And uh, it continued along with the grand to be a very successful cinema, the two of them together until 1956, when a lot happened and changed for the Radway because Unfortunately, the Grand Cinema burnt down, leaving the Radway as the sole surviving cinema in Sidmouth. And that it has remained right through to the present day. The stage was always continued to be used right through the Second World War and well into the 50s and 60s, but most of the time it was films, but there were the occasional one night stands and, and weekly runs. And in fact, the Sidmouth Arts Club uh, used it for on many occasions to present their Gilbert and Sullivan operas. However, the last time the stage was used at the Radway was for the Folk Festival as late as 1993. Now it has gone through many refurbishments and modernization and it's now run by Scott Cinemas along with WTW Cinemas. And although they've modernized and brought it up to date with all the new technology, they still looked after the building and kept it with the times, but have preserved that 1928 traditional look, even keeping the circle and the stalls in operation as a single cinema. So a fine uh, building and an asset to the town with a long history. So if we could now move to the theater in the town, which of course is the Manor Pavilion, which you'll see on the next slide. Now this was built as the Manor Hall, and we go right back to 1891. And it was built by the Lord of the Manor at the time, John Edmund Hugh Balfour, who later became Colonel Balfour. And the architects were a London firm called R.C. Murray, and they were a, a firm of architects that the Manor Estate were using at the time. And in the next slide, you'll see what the hall originally looked like not long after it opened. It's a large building on a corner site of Manor Road and Station Road. Now on the station road elevation, it comprised of offices for the manor estate. And um, interestingly, these were occupied by Mr. Hastings, the solicitor, and uh, R.W. Sampson, the estate's architect. They had offices here before they later on moved across to Fortville Chambers. Now above these offices was a small hall and that was used for lectures and meetings, etc. And then behind this dressing rooms, which linked on to the next block of the building, which was a fine big concert hall and ballroom rising up uh, Manor Road. And in the next slide, you'll be able to see what the hall looked like inside. Now it was a large multi-purpose hall and it was built really totally for the people of Sidmouth to use for uh, anything from dances, balls, exhibitions and theatre shows. And it gradually became the first permanent theatre in Sidmouth. In fact, um, uh, the architect uh, R.W. Sampson, he was a keen amateur performer and he performed many times on that stage in Gilbert and Sullivan op operas. Also in the early days, magic lantern shows were shown here by the visiting touring uh, companies that uh, accompanied lectures and meetings, etc. And also using the hall then for his magic lantern shows was the local photographer, Arthur Ellis, who we'll talk about later. And uh, during the Second World War, it was used uh, for uh, shows that were put on by the RAF, 
and they were stationed nearby. And for over a hundred years, it's been used for all sorts of occasions on, in this multi-purpose hall. However, change came in 1952 when Colonel Balfour died and the whole of the estate was taken by the then over by the then Sidmouth Urban Council. And many changes have taken since then. Uh, first one was um, the name was changed to the Manor Pavilion. This gave it a more theatrical feel. The council always wanted to try and move it away from this multi-purpose concert hall and give it a more of a theatrical feel. And this they did in 1952. Uh, also, a new foyer and entrance block were added. And uh, the small hall became, first of all, a cafe and then the theatre bar, which, which it is to this day. The old offices became um, the art centre. But the biggest change that happened was as late as 1972, when the whole hall was reversed, the large hall was moved from one end of the hall to the other, along with the stage. And if you could see in the next slide, you'll see uh, the hall reversed. That's the one, that's how the theater looks today. Originally, the stage was at the Eastern end, but then moved, as you can see in this picture, to the Western end, along with proper tiered theater seating are put in. Uh, also at this time, a dressing room block and a scenery dock were built behind. And uh, that is how the theatre looks today and is, is very well liked and very well used by the people of Sidmouth. Especially it's well known for its weekly rep seasons every summer and of course the annual pantomime uh, held by the Sidmouth Amateur Dramatic Society. So another fine asset to the town, the Manor Pavilion, with a very long and interesting history. And now I'd like to go into the town with you and show you some buildings, again, that used to be entertainment buildings. So on the next slide, which I'll show you here, is the, which I'm sure you might recognise as the Chattery Restaurant. Now this is in fact the Grand Cinema, and it opened in 1929. The owner of it was the, the person who I've mentioned earlier, Arthur Ellis, the photographer, and the architect was R.W. Sampson. And it, this replaced Ellis's earlier small cinema at the bottom of Ball Street. Now, this was the first and only purpose-built cinema in Sidmouth. And it was also the first to bring talking pictures to the town with the jazz singer in 1929. It seated 535 and it opened on the 4th of February, 1929. Um, the opening uh, program was the Gaumont Graphic News, followed by a film called His House in Order. Now, to, to give you an idea of how splendid this building looked, I'll, I'll read from the opening night's brochure just to give you an idea. So in the next slide, please, you'll see how the grand looked when it opened. And from this brochure, it states that from a spacious foyer with marble walls and stone columns, Visitors went along a corridor to a small lounge. From there, the local circle was entered through double doors. The grand circle was reached by a broad flight of stairs at the top of which was also a tea room. Floors were finished in black and white imitation marble. The interior was panelled in rows with a darker red surround and gold mouldings around the panels. An arch ceiling rose above this, decorated in square panels of tangerine with dark wood cross members. The proscenium arch was of green and gold imitation marble, whilst massive columns ran along each side of the walls. So you can imagine this was a real splendid, luxurious addition to the sap town when it opened in the late 20s. Uh, it also had an orchestra pit with a, a concert organ and, of course, an orchestra to accompany the silent films in those days. And it continued for over 20 years and was well respected and used by the people of Sidmouth. However, I'm afraid disaster struck the ground. At midday on Wednesday, the 26th of September, a fire broke out in the roof void. Uh, the ceiling collapsed. And as you can see from those uh, newspaper pictures, total destruction of the auditorium happened and uh, it was an, an awful loss to the town. 
Uh, thankfully, uh, there was no injuries. It happened at midday and there were no public in the building, but the whole of the auditorium was destroyed. Luckily, the front part of the building, which remains today uh, as the Chattery restaurant, that remained and was virtually unharmed by the fire. The, the building was in two separate blocks. Uh, so that remains today as the Chattery and two uh, our shops either side and the old tea room above. But the auditorium space behind was totally destroyed and the, the owners at the time thought it wasn't financially possible really to rebuild, especially during the early 50s. And um, it was sold off for development. And in fact, the St. John's Ambulance headquarters are, are on the site now. But I, I even believe now that th those uh, are going to be demolished. And I think permission has been given for flats to be built on the site. But as I say, thankfully, Samson's wonderful contribution to cinema architecture remains uh, in, in the street, there in, in the high street as the Chattery restaurant. So now we'll look at another building. If I could have the next slide, please. And we'll move down right down to the bottom of 4th Street and turn off left to East Street. Now, this is very important because this was the site of Sidmouth's first ever theatre. And we have to go right back to the early 1800s now, when Sidmouth was, um, well, it was still developing really from a small fishing village to the present, present fashionable and busy seaside resort of today. And in those days, the, the town was visited by strolling players. Um, they would perform in the street or in local inns on the seafront or on the Bedford lawns. And they were looking for a more permanent home to hold their popular plays of melodrama or Shakespeare. Now, there's not a lot of being recorded about this uh, early theatre, but I have found out that uh, I believe it was on the north side of East Street and it was converted from an old barn or storage building and very simply converted with uh, benches as seats on a, a wooden floor with a small wooden stage at the end with a proscenium with dressing rooms. And it was visited right through uh, the early 1800s. In fact, we find a, a season advertised in 1803. And through all this time, it affectionately became known, East Street became known as Theatre Lane. And uh, there were spasmodic seasons through, throughout the early 1800s, uh, but I'm afraid the last recording was in a guidebook in 1877, when it was reported that the little theatre in Theatre Lane has long been disused and the premises are now the blacksmith's Mr. Lawrence. So uh, we don't know where that was. I do intend to do a lot of more research on this little theatre. And as I say, not a lot is recorded, but I'm sure that I will find out more in time and I will let you all know. Because today I'm afraid there is no trace of the building whatsoever. But you can stand in uh, East Street and uh, uh, put a thought to the early Georgian theatre that once stood in that street. And now let's move just round to the corner uh, to the next slide, please, which I'm sure you'll all recognise as Fat Face, the clothes retailer. Now, this is very important because this was Sidmouth's first permanent cinema, uh, and it was uh, built by Arthur Ellis. Now, he'd been showing his um, moving pictures at the drill hall on the seafront, but he uh, found that a bit inconvenient uh, sharing it with the soldiers doing their drills, and he really needed a permanent building of his own. So he got the architect, again, R.W. Sampson, to build and convert this old restaurant called the Bellevue. And if I could have the next slide, please. He converted that into the entrance foyer and um, entrance to this beautiful little Edwardian cinema that Ellis built. And on land behind this, he built a, a lovely little Edwardian auditorium. And in the next slide, you can see this. Uh, it had 350 seats on a single raked floor with a very high ceiling. And attention was paid particularly to fire safety. Uh, there were many exits and a fireproof projection box was placed high up on the roof. And to quote from the local press at the time, it says that the seating was very luxurious, as you can see. It was richly upholstered in crimson. And at the screen end, you can see there, it was very elaborate, beautifully designed and most effective. 
And you can see there on the back wall, uh, literally the screen was painted, a whitewashed screen was painted on the back wall there. And in front of that, you can just about see that was a small orchestra pit for a, a pianist or occasionally a small orchestra would be there to accompany the silent films. Now, during the First World War, um, it showed the news of all the uh, war pictures and images of the war. And interestingly, uh, in 1918, when we, they had the uh, epidemic of the Spanish flu, a member of staff was employed to walk down the aisle with a spray, swinging this spray so it would disinfect and cleanse all the walls and seats and obviously some of the patrons as well. And this is, I'm afraid, I can't I help but remind me of how things are today in the present circumstances. But uh, that goes right back to 1918. Now, silent pictures and cinema in general all over the country were incredibly popular by this time. And uh, Sidmouth was no, no exception. And Ellis's little cinema that he was really very proud of, he took a personal interest in this. It really became the victim of its own success. And Ellis decided to build a much bigger and more modern cinema, the Grand, which we've mentioned at the top of the high street. And the little cinema closed on February, 1929. And the next day, the ground opened. For a while, it was disused, and then it became, the building became Knight's Clothing Shop. Now, interestingly, when Knight's had it, they inserted a balcony in there for extra space to display their clothes. And a lot of people think that that balcony belonged to the cinema, but in fact, it didn't. As, as I mentioned, it was a single floor in Ellis's little cinema, and this was just for extra space for them. In fact, when Fat Face took over in uh, 2010, they removed this balcony, but they did restore all the wonderful old plasterwork, which still remains to this day. And if you walk into Fat Face now, if you try and ignore the clothes and look up high above you and towards the back wall, you will still see all the old uh, plasterwork and elaborate decoration of Ellis's little cinema and indeed Arthur Ellis's architecture. And look at the back wall in the shop and you will still see the proscenium arch with the whitewashed space where the screen would have been when all those years ago, those silent films flickered away. And now let's move on just round the corner to this other building, which I'm sure you'll recognize again, all boarded up and feeling sorry for itself at the moment. This was a very famous little concert hall called Trump's Winter Gardens. Now I have to tell you straight away, there is no um, sort of connection or relation to a particular man across the Atlantic. This was John Trump and he owned a grocery shop in Four Street. And by 1910, it was being run by his son, William, who decided to extend the shop and open a cafe further down in Four Street. And this was to be called Trump's Cafe. And you can see there in the drain pipe, uh, there, still there today, actually, a tea for Trump to, to, he was so proud of the whole complex. So in the next slide, please, you'll see the original concert hall in the Winter Gardens, which was behind the cafe. The uh, cafe was in an old house. It was converted. Again, this was in 4th Street. and was converted by R.W. Sampson again. But behind this, running in Dove Lane, was the Winter Gardens. And there you see it all decked out. It looks like it was for um, a celebration of some sort. Primarily, the hall was to be used by Trump's employees for their celebrations, uh, occasions, and birthdays, and weddings, etc. But the hall could be hired out for anybody else that wanted to use it for concerts, dances, and meetings, etc. And it was used by the public of Sidmouth for over 60 years. It was a beautiful little hall, as you can see there, elaborately decorated with a dome ceiling with a glass roof. And there was a, a lovely dance floor and at one end, uh, a little stage where the orchestra would play. Now, over the years, it was used more and more, but towards the end of the 60s and into the 1970s, became to be used by the youth of the town more and they, they started to hire it out for dances and discotheques and eventually a nightclub. And in the next slide, you'll see what it became really famous for, Karina's nightclub. <laughs> 
now it's funny whenever I talk to people of a certain age in Sidmouth they always have fond memories of their youth at uh, Karina's nightclub back in the 1980s. I'm afraid this too closed in uh, 2018 and the whole building was boarded up and put up for sale. Uh, today the old cafe, Trump's old cafe in 4th Street has become a restaurant, a very nice restaurant called 14 Miles East. But the old winter gardens behind in Dove Lane remains all boarded up and for sale. I believe that planning permission has been given to convert it into retail use for shops uh, use. But if this and when this happens, let's hope that the new owners will respect the hall inside, which still retains all that wonderful plasterwork and panelling and the dome ceiling. We'll wait and see. But a, a, a lovely, quite, quite well known hall that's now disused in the middle of Sidmouth. And now I'd like to move to the seafront with you all. And uh, in the next slide, we'll see uh, yet again uh, another sad sight, I'm afraid, but let's hope not for long. This is the drill hall, and this opened in 1895. Now, this is very important for where, where cinema is concerned, because this was the first building to show moving pictures permanently in Sidmouth. Uh, various traveling um, exhibitions with film, moving films had visited the town, either at fairgrounds or traveling showmen, but this was the first permanent sort of conversion of a, a, to, to be a, a full-time cinema. The, the actual hall was built for the 3rd Volunteer Rifle Battalion to hold their drills in, but it could be hired out for exhibitions, concerts, meetings and dances, etc. And of course, in the next slide, you'll see in those days, it looked very different to how it does now. Uh, a very elaborate front. Uh, you can see a little clock, quite a large clock in the gable there that overlooked the sea uh, and uh, beautiful bay windows. And, and at the side of the building, slightly out of shot there, there was a balcony on the outside running the whole length of the hall uh, with French windows that opened out onto uh, the views of the cliffs and the sea. Now, this is where Arthur Ellis, who uh, I will mention uh, again, because we'll talk about him later, this is so important with cinema, because this is where Arthur Ellis used to show his early moving pictures with his recently purchased bioscope projector. Now, he would originally show them on a trestle table in the middle of the hall onto a makeshift screen at the other end. And they became incredibly popular, these viewings, and he decided that Sidmouth really needed a permanent cinema. So he converted the hall into a cinema in 1910. Now he got permission to do this on the condition that he still had to share the hall with the soldiers during their drill practices, and this he did. It was still a very difficult conversion, and this was because of the Cinematograph Act of 1910, which had just come into force. And the act uh, required a strong emphasis and attention to fire safety. In those days, film contained nitrate, which was highly flammable, and there'd been many um, fatal fires in cinemas up and down the country. So it was very important that uh, the projector and the projectionist had to be totally separate from the audience. Um, now, usually in a cinema conversion or purpose-built cinema, this was done by a projection box, which was a brick building uh, on the outside of the building uh, auditorium and to show the films from it. This, this couldn't happen at the drill hall. And um, Ellis bought what was called an iron house. Now, this was literally how it sounds. It was a, a, a large iron room or box where he would sit with the projector, totally encased and fireproof away from the audience. Even the little windows or ports, as they're called, where the projection beam shone from, had metal shutters on them, which would immediately close down the whole thing if there was any sign of a fire inside. In fact, uh, he projected films from here, and the story goes that he became so hot in that box that after a, a showing, it would take him days to recover from the heat, so this just goes to show how dedicated Arthur Ellis was to, to showing his films. Uh, he also in, employed a pianist, of course, because the films were still silent and a small orchestra sometimes to accompany them. And uh, also he uh, employed variety acts 
because the film reels were only 15 to 20 minutes long, the, the little spools, and it would take time to change them, rewind them, and then lace up another one. And during this time, you would employ these uh, comedians or jugglers or singers to entertain the audience. So a whole variety show plus films would take place in the drill hall's early days as a cinema. Now, he used the hall for two years uh, and he did find it really inconvenient having to share, as you can imagine, with the drill practices. Plus the, the hall really wasn't 100% suitable for a cinema. So he moved out and went to his little cinema that he'd built, as, we, as we've mentioned, in 4th Street. Now the drill hall did, continued to be used for many years for many, many occasions. However, the appearance changed, I'm afraid, and uh, along with the seafront and with the flood defence schemes of the 1920s, the hall and the whole of the promenade changed their appearance. In 1929, a, a toilet block was added uh, that that's, uh, exists today, and that completely obliterated the view from the French windows and the little balcony over to the cliffs. So eventually that was taken away, the balcony was removed. And then in 1931, the whole of the hall was refurbished, including the front there, which was completely stripped of all its ornamation and uh, the, um, the, the, given a more plain, supposedly art deco look. And that plain, simple look remains uh, in the form that it is today. It continued to be used, um, but less and less as years went by. And when the Territorial Army moved out in the 1970s, they went to a more modern building. The hall really became quite run down and in need of repair. And eventually it was quite dangerous and it was boarded up by the council, taken over by the council in view for demolition. However, the Sidmouth Drill Hall Hub was formed and they were determined that this hall should not be demolished and that it should be returned to the people of Sidmouth, which is who it was built for in the first place. And they worked very, very hard with the council and eventually persuaded them to uh, not demolish the hall. And the council agreed to put the hall on the market for sale, either to the private sector or for community use. In the end, uh, the private sector won and they got the permission to build a restaurant in the hall, which is ongoing at the moment with present times, but the, if all goes well, the hall will be converted tastefully into a restaurant and they will preserve some of the original features and hopefully bring the appearance back and make it a, a, a well-liked and well, um, a nice, charming building that it always has been or when it was originally built on the seafront. So we will wait and see. Let's hope that's not too long. And now, Let's move right to the other end of the promenade and up to Connaught Gardens. And there you'll see the splendid bandstand. Now, when I first visited Sidmouth, I, I was told there was a bandstand up there and I, I immediately thought of a, a traditional Edwardian circular um, platform in the middle of an open space. And I, I had an incredibly ple pleasant surprise when I saw this, what I really thought was an open air theater. Uh, and it was later that I found out that indeed it has been used for these purposes as well. Uh, Connaught Gardens was built, the, the council demolished an old house and retained some of the old garden walls and the gardens and developed it into this beautiful Connaught Gardens. This was in 1934 when it opened. Uh, and they built at the bottom of a, a, a lovely sloping lawn guarded by flower beds, a platform stage for the uh, Sidmouth band, town band. And either side of the stage, which you can see there and today, it's still got the little pavilions that were brick built for the changing rooms for the band and, and the artists. Uh, it's a, a beautiful little theatre. Uh, I will always think of it as a theatre rather than a bandstand. And it was opened in 1934 by the Duke of Connaught with the uh, Sidmouth town band. And they have played there right through to the present day. Uh, however, I, I was right in my suspicions, there have been many theatre shows there as well, as it's a perfect venue. Uh, there have been orchestral concerts, it's been used for children's theatre, uh, Shakespeare performances, and of course, the annual folk festival have, have well used this as, as a venue. So it's, it's a beautiful little theatre, well worth a visit if you, if you don't know it, 
And uh, in the 19, 1974, actually, it was made to look even more like a theatre because the, can the canopy was added by the council, which gave it a more of a proscenium arch and theatrical look. And that's how it looks today. So a great asset to the town at Connaught Gardens. And now let's move back in towards the town down the hill. And in the next slide, we see this splendid Victoria Hotel. Now this opened in 1903 and the architect, yes, it was again, R.W. Sampson. Now, when I was doing research for my book, it was in the latter stages that I actually came across a, a photograph that said, this is the little private cinema at the Victoria Hotel. And I, I knew nothing about this. So obviously I thought I must find out, find out more. And apparently in 1963, the manager of the hotel then was a bit of a film buff and cinema lover. And he got permission from the owners of the hotel to convert some old wine cellars and a storeroom in the basement into a, a lovely little cinema for the residents of the hotel. And in the next slide, you'll see what it looked like. As you can see, it was a perfect little cinema with the proper theater seats, a little stage, curtains and just out of sight there was the entrance to it uh, with a little foyer there with a staircase that went up to the uh, main hotel foyer. Now in, in those days um, hotels didn't have televisions in their bedrooms and uh, the residents visited what was called a television lounge somewhere in the hotel uh, where all the uh, residents could watch their favorite TV programs. However, the Victoria went one step further and built this private cinema just to be used by the guests to watch films. Uh, the films were supplied and shown by an Exeter company called the Western Cine Services, and they presented the films on 16 mil. Um, and this happened for over 20 years. Unfortunately, as uh, time went by, um, the popularity of cinema waned and uh, hotel bedrooms eventually, certainly by the end of the 70s, all had televisions in them. And uh, the hotel decided to close the little cinema. Uh, and believe it or not, they converted it into the indoor swimming pool, which still remains to this day in the hotel. And if you're lucky enough or uh, just visit the hotel and uh, can look at the, the swimming pool, you'll still see the shape of the old walls, which are there in the photograph and the little foyer with the staircase still exists. It's all a reminder of the once a splendid little hidden gem at the Victoria Hotel. And now in the next slide, I must show a gentleman that I've spoken about many times and it's very important we talk about him because uh, he made an incredible contribution to the town, Arthur Ellis. He was a true entrepreneur and showman. I'll tell you a little bit about Mr. Ellis. He was originally from London and he'd moved to Sidmouth in his early twenties. And uh, he became a photographer in the town and he became very well liked by the, the public. They'd always take photographs of uh, local events, the uh, lifeboat being launched, uh, sporting occasions, weddings. And he, he became very well liked and very well used for his services as a photographer. In fact, uh, by the age of 25, he had opened his own little shop and studio, which now incidentally is the cat's protection shop, which still exists there in the, uh, in the high street. He'd also purchased a magic lantern and he was showing uh, his, uh, that and his services could be used for lectures and presentations at meetings with his um, magic lantern. And later on, he purchased Again, one of the first in Sidmouth to purchase a bioscope projector, which to, to show his moving films. Now, I personally think that Arthur Ellis was a man of many firsts, if you like. He was the first local man to use a magic lantern in the town. He was the first to show moving pictures with his bioscope projector. He was the first to open a cinema, which he did in the drill hall. He was the first to build a permanent cinema, his own little cinema, which was called Ellis's Little Cinema. And he was the first to build a purpose-built cinema, which I think was his crowning achievement, really, which was the Grand Cinema. And he was also the first to bring talking pictures to Sidmouth, which he did with the jazz singer at the Grand in 1929. 
Now, in the early 1930s, the, the film industry had changed dramatically from Ellis's earlier days of silent uh, movies and his little cinema enterprise. And it had moved into the Hollywood era of big corporate organizations with um, very demanding film booking and large cinema circuits were being taking over the little independent slots for film um, booking. And Ellis really didn't like how the, the business was, was going. And he really decided that this was time to move on. And luckily he concentrated now on his lucrative photography business, which still existed in the town. He sadly died in a London hospital after an operation in 1939. However, his stepson, who, uh, well, confusingly as well as interestingly, was called Arthur Ellis, the same initials, he carried on the photography business for a while. Now, I firmly believe that without Arthur Ellis's contribution, the development of cinema in Sidmouth would not have happened so quickly as it did. And now in the next slide, if you can see there, I have a chapter in my book and it's called When is a Theatre Not a Theatre? Because um, there are certain buildings, although not don't fall into either of those categories, they have played an important part in entertainment. And I go into full details of all these buildings that you can see, but I'll, I'll just quickly go through them now from uh, the top left clockwise. And you see there the uh, old assembly rooms, which is now the um, sea salt shop. And they were in the old London Inn and they were used for over 200 years for meetings and dances and concerts. And then we have the market hall, the present building, which replaced an old town hall, which was used for concerts and dances and meetings, etc. And then you see the beautiful ballroom, which is now the music room next to the Sidham Hotel. And this dates right back to, to uh, 1854 and has been presenting concerts and recitals of a very high standard ever since. And then you see the parish church of St. Giles and St. Nicholas. Again, this holds regular concerts. And then you can see that uh, huge Cinerama screen. And that, believe it or not, is the Methodist Church Hall where Cinerama was presented for a while. Again, you can read all about this in my book. And on to the next slide, we have to mention this, the Sidmouth Folk Festival. And to quote again from my book, I say that this is when the whole town of Sidmouth becomes a theatre. Uh, right back from when it started in 1955, the festival uh, has been performing in every street corner, ballroom, inn, cafe, uh, open air theatre, theatres, cinemas, and the whole town comes alive at this event. And in the photograph there, you can see a wonderful arena theatre which was created and was used for the main events. And this was at the Knoll. And this was used from 1970 right through to 2004 until it moved to a more sheltered spot, which is now in the Ham. However, it, it's recently been announced that a new outdoor amphitheatre is planned at the Knoll, not far from where the old one was. And that is incorporated in the uh, new Sidmouth flood prevention scheme. So that the history of entertainment in Sidmouth continues then into the future. So I look forward along with everyone, I'm sure, to seeing this new venue and visiting it in the future. So to summarize, I've really enjoyed talking about my, my book this afternoon. And uh, when you buy it, you'll find that there's much more detail of all the buildings, people and places that I've mentioned, along with many more photographs that, of the places that I've described. I also cover a, a general outlook and history of the whole of uh, history of cinema and theatre in Great Britain and how it uh, affected the development in Sidmouth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, John. That was absolutely fabulous. And um, what I'd like to do now, before um, uh, reading out some questions that have come through to us um, from people that have been listening, I'd just like to make one or two general uh, an announcements, if I may. Uh, 
Yes. The first is that John's already mentioned that, of course, that his book, which is an SDA publication, uh, can be bought. Um, if you check the SVA website uh, or the museum website, then you can find full details, not only of John's book, but of um, all our publications. Uh, we're offering free delivery for anybody who uh, lives in the Sid Valley. And um, Christmas is coming up. <laughs> and therefore, uh, perhaps you might think about it for yourselves or for friends or for relatives, uh, any of the books. We've had, of course, a rather lean year as far as the museum's been concerned because the shop's been closed all year. And therefore, we rely very much, uh, as far as revenue is concerned, uh, on sales um, online at the moment. Um, when Paragon uh, Bookshop and Winston's are allowed to reopen again, they also have copies of our publications, including John's. Uh, I think many people that have been uh, watching and listening are members of the Sidvale Association. If you're not, please do consider uh, becoming a member and the website is given at the bottom there. Uh, and I'd like to also finally mention that the next talk is by Ed Dolphin on trees, which is on the 9th of December. The yes, I, 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 wondered, I wondered, John, if I could ask you a question myself. Yes. And that is that you've given a, a, a fabulous um, outline of all the places in Sidmouth, and it seems almost like a history of Samson, to be honest. Um, yes. Many yeah. of the buildings, um, which is extraordinary. Uh, there's no reason why you should know the background in other towns in South Devon, but do you think Sidmouth is unusual, or do you think um, other towns, if you look at them carefully, would be able to match um, what's happening here? Uh, no, certainly not, because it, it, other towns that I've uh, studied and done work on, it's not had such a local connection with uh, architects, especially, and cinema owners. They've always had been people that have moved out either from a, a small chain of cinemas that are in existence. Even in the um, silent picture days, there'd be a small chain of cinemas and they would uh, go, go to a town. So that, that never happened in Sidmouth. It was always the local people who all seemed to, to work with each other, the owners, the architects, and uh, the, the builders. They all seem to come from Sidmouth. So this, this is what I said right from the start. It's quite unique for this to have happened in the town. Uh, we do have a question here. Um, this is from uh, Ed. Ed, who's giving the next talk in December. He's asked, if you know how much it would cost to see a film, well, I guess it would depend when we're talking, what the prices would be. Yes, I mean, it, 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 the, the, in the, what in the early in silent picture days, they would only be like um, threepence to a shilling, depending. They had lots of different seating arrangements. The, the cheap seats, they, you could get those for a penny right down at the front, which would usually be wooden benches. And then they got better as the because the, the the view of the screen in a cinema, the rear seats, which is totally reversed to a theatre, the rear seats are better and more expensive because you're away from the screen. Uh, whereas in a theatre, it's totally the opposite. It's better to sit as near to the stage as possible. So were, it's difficult to answer the, the the question because there were so many different price ranges. But it's certainly in the silent picture days. You're talking of pennies. Uh, up, up to probably a shilling or a shilling and sixpence into the posh seats at the back. Thank you very much. I heard a, I read a great story about Arthur Ellis. He must have had quite a presence. He looks like a rather diminutive, um, very slim chap, but apparently yeah. quite often he would stand uh, in front of the audience if a film was about to start and speak sternly to the children that they should yeah. behave uh, during yeah. the performance. And, and, and yeah. they did which is a rather touching story. Yeah, he, he took a strong personal interest, especially in his little cinema in Fourth Street. He was always doing front of house duty. If he wasn't out the front in the street, sort of barking people to come in, yet you're right, he'd be inside uh, looking after the audience. He was a true uh, showman and uh, uh, really fantastic, dedicated cinema manager. He, he must have loved that little cinema. I mean, it was affectionately called Ellis's Little Cinema uh, and quite rightly so.
Well, we're indebted to uh, to him, and we're also indebted to you, John, for a, a fantastic talk. Uh, thank thank you. you. Thank you very much indeed. And we look forward uh, to um, Ed, Ed Dolphin, on the 9th of December. And uh, with that, I'm going to um, say goodbye to everybody. Thank you for attending. Thank you. Bye-bye.